morning, y'all. <laughs> I'm Pastor George. Uh, I'll be talking to you today. Um, I just got back from Texas about 12 hours ago. So this should be interesting. If I'm loopy at all, you know why. Um, I wrote a lot of this message while I was high. 38,000 feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, I don't smoke weed. <laughs> Do I have any prison break fans in here today? Yeah. Hey. Come on. Yeah. What up? Just a couple guys. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so you might recognize this, maybe. Anyway, um, so like I said, I was in Texas this whole last week almost, and um, yesterday we were at Fort Worth, the stockyards, and we were just exploring around. I was hanging out with my buddies Kelvin and Eric, who's not in here, and we were just trying to find the coolest thing that we can see and do. And so we were looking around, and in the distance we saw a building, this one right here, and we thought, what is that? It's all graffitied up. It looks like a prison, and we have to go see it. <laughs> so we walked over there. Um, we gave ourselves a tour of the building. So it was pretty <laughs> cool. We walked around inside, got to the top, and it was pretty freaky. I'll tell you that, though, even in the daylight, just inside all the graffiti and the rubble and stuff. Um, but it was cool. And it turns out I looked up the history because I wanted to know, is it a prison? I'm like, what is this place? It looked like one, but it turns out it's um, a meat packing plant, an abandoned meat packing plant. So not so cool. But <laughs> but this building right here is Sona. So if you've seen Prison Break, we were at the prison that they filmed Sona at. Well, it's not prison, but so that's pretty sweet. <laughs> we weren't in that building. We were in the one across from it, unfortunately, but we're still within within the defense of it. So that's pretty cool. And you're probably wondering what that has to do with anything I'm going to talk on, and you'll see you later. So, like um, Pastor Eli said last week, today I'm preaching on sin. Why sin? So to start off, I want to give you a working definition of what sin is. And this is it. Failure to love God and love people. Sorry about my handwriting. So failure to love God and love people. That's what we're going to call sin today. So anything you do to um, not love or anything you do to, to upset or hurt God or hurt another person is a sin. And the thing that happens when you sin, when you, when you break this love relationship, is you distance yourself from God. Kind of like in the same way as if I had a friend and I constantly lied to them all the time, we would further distance ourselves because they wouldn't like me so much and eventually we wouldn't be friends anymore. And kind of in that same way, sin separates us from God. So before we go any further, we got our working definition of sin. Let's, sorry Ed Young, but let us pray. <laughs> God, just thank you so much that you have a plan for us. God, there's a plan of redemption. I thank you that you sent Jesus. Uh, Lord, I pray that today you would reveal and give us understanding to what sin is and how we can overcome it, God. And we just thank you for your presence here today, and we ask that you speak to us. Amen. All right, so sin is failure to love God. And, and when you think of sin, a lot of people think, you know, I punched my friend in the nose, and that's a sin. <laughs> But it's more than an action. It's not just actions that make sin. Uh, Matthew 23, 27 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, with beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. And then we're just going to go through the rest of these. Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And then Matthew 12, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. 
And Jesus said all these things. He even called them vipers, which is weird. But so he's saying it's not only what you do that that is sin. It's what you think, and it's the condition of of your thought life and um, your heart. Like it says, out of the heart comes all these sins, not just out of your hands and body. So, my main point today is sin is a condition of the heart. That's, if you forget everything else, that's what I want you to remember. Sin, the sinful nature, is a condition of your heart. And we'll look right here at Matthew 5, 27. It says, this is Jesus talking, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So just to keep going on what I've been telling you, kind of in the same way, if I have this person, when every time I think of them, I just think bad thoughts, I think of how stupid they are, how much I want to hurt them. If I think these things, I've already murdered them in my heart. I've already sinned against them, failed to love them in my heart. And then this other verse says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. This is Paul talking, um, the great apostle, saying that in his sinful nature, in and of himself, he can't do good. He can't get away from sin. A lot of us treat our hearts like a prison. I'm going to draw a simple diagram. Hopefully you can follow it. So here's your heart. There's the wall around it of the prison. You're taking in all this bad stuff. So whatever is bad thoughts, um, sin and hate and whatever else, and then every once in a while, one breaks out. But you're trying so hard to not let people see the, the bad that's in you, the sin that's in you. And you, every once in a while, something will slip out and people will be like, whoa, that's, that's really what you think? That's really who you are? And so it's a prison, there's a wall, and we don't, we keep everything in, in our evil hearts. Today, I want to debunk a myth for you. If you see Mythbusters, yeah. I'm here to help you. <laughs> so, a lot of people think that Christians are the perfect people. They are basically Jesus. And that is a myth. Christians still sin, and even more so, pastors still sin. It's true. It is. And everybody is human. There's no perfect person except for Jesus. And so, so for those of you who have come here and maybe you're not a believer, and you look at the rest of us and we're all like hypocrites because we um, act so good, but really we're, we're still sinners, but we have a Savior. This quote that my youth pastor used to tell us when I was in youth ministry as a student, it's always stuck in my mind um, when thinking about sin. Sorry, this is like a picture of Alcatraz. If you guys have seen this, so that kind of goes along with my diagram. Like, you can't get out. Maybe one will swim away every once in a while, but for the most part, you're just harboring in all this, this evilness. So here's a quote. Sin is spectacular, but the fallout is nuclear. And this is just what he means by this or at least what I think he means, what I mean by this, is that sin, it's fun. Like, it'll feel good, it'll make you happy for the time being. Like, why not sin? And that's what a lot of people in the world think. You know, there's songs that say, so what, we get high, so what, we get drunk, we're just having fun. Like, it's, that's, the, that's the culture, that's the mindset, is that sin is fun. But the fallout is nuclear, there's consequences to it in this life and in eternity. So you're going to have to deal with those consequences in this life and then spend eternity separated from God because of those choices. So sin is a pretty bad thing, as you can tell by now. Um, I don't see why anybody would want to live in sin given a correct understanding of what it is. So I'm going to let you know how we deal with sin as Christians, how we deal with sins as Christ followers. All right, here I have a picture of an airplane that's flying through a storm. And this last week I had the chance to ride on an airplane two times to Texas and back. And 
we, we had a little bit of turbulence, especially the second flight. And, you know, I was sitting there screaming like a girl inside my head, but just <laughs> like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> and um, I, was, I was just sitting there holding on, hoping that we'd make it, because I couldn't see anything I didn't know was happening. But what, what sin is, what our sinful nature desires to do in this analogy is that we want to go up to the captain and be like, get out of here, let me drive. And then you take over. I don't know about you, but I don't know how to drive an airplane. So if I'm driving, we're screwed. <laughs> but the thing is, you need to give control over. Even though it's scary, even though it requires trust, you have to trust that the pilot knows what he's doing. But it's still the only way. Because if you get up behind the wheel, you're toast. And so, who do we surrender to? Who's this pilot in my analogy? It's Jesus. See, Jesus is God in human form. He came to earth and lived a life and died and rose again. And during his life, he was tempted to sin. The same way that we were. He wasn't like immune to temptation. He wasn't immune to the, um, the sinful nature in a sort. Like, you know, he still had the, the temptation to act upon things, to fail to love people. And especially with some of the people he was dealing with. He called them vipers. And he never sinned, though. He always perfectly fulfilled the commandment to love God and to love people. And because of this, he was able to die in our place. So all those consequences, all the, the death that we had earned by, by sinning and by living in our sinful nature, Jesus died and took all those upon him so that, that we don't have to face that penalty, so we don't have to face that consequence. And so the thing is, when you live and surrender to Jesus, and when you're constantly pursuing his presence, it will change your heart. See, earlier we saw how, like Paul was saying, we can't change our hearts in and of ourselves. We're stuck in this sinful nature, and, and by ourselves we can't do anything to shape our heart. We're just stuck. But in God's presence, trusting in Jesus and surrendering to him, then he will start to change our hearts. All we have to do is give him control. So I want to give you the other diagram. This is what happens to your heart when you are surrendered to Jesus. So on one side we have the prison where you're harboring all this sinfulness and evil, allowing some to slip out. And the other we'll call the spring of life. So in this, our hearts are are constantly taking in godliness, taking in good thoughts, and the image of Christ, basically, and constantly letting it flow out. So not, not any longer do we have this wall around our hearts where we're taking in all this sin and just hoping that nobody sees it, and hoping nobody sees how bad we are, but we're taking in godliness, and it's flowing out of us because of our relationship with God. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, it's a lot of whatevers. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So no longer is our heart thinking about malice and immorality and hate and anger, but we should think about things that are noble and right and pure and lovely, and those things will change our heart as we live in God's presence and flow out of us. And that's how people should see Christians, not as hypocrites who are trying to hide their sin and look like whitewashed tombs on the outside, but as people who are living as Christ followers who love is flowing out. And so instead of failing to love God and love people and sin, we are fulfilling the, the role that Christ has called us to, to be the light and salt of the earth. This is the last verse I want to share with you today. Galatians 2.20. This is the hope of Christians. This is, this is our motto. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's no longer us trying to be good and trying to, to hide the, the bad stuff and show the good stuff. It's no longer a play, it's no longer a skip, 
we can just let go and let God take over and start to shape our hearts. And that's how you overcome sin. See, like I said earlier, Christians, you're still going to sin. You're still going to struggle. You're still going to make mistakes. But God is working through you, and you're continually becoming more <coughs> like Christ. I just want to end with this one, one note today. Maybe you're here and you don't know God. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. Or maybe you're here and you've been struggling to control yourself and struggling to, to keep the control instead of giving it to God. I just want to tell you to get out of God's throne and let Him change your heart. That's it's as simple as that. So as, as you go home today, whatever you do this week, if you want to um, be living as Christ wants you to live, then get out of God's throne and let Him change your heart. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have a plan for us. I thank you that before you even created anything, you knew that you'd have to send Jesus to die for us. And I thank you that you still chose to, that we're worth it to you. God, I thank you that you are the ultimate example of loving us and loving others. And God, that we look to you to change our hearts and help us to overcome the sin and the sinful nature that has been in us since birth. And God, I just pray for freedom. In Jesus' name, you said that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So God, we want to continually be living in your presence, God, continually living, seeking after you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And one thing, um, if you're here today and you want prayer for anything, if you have a need, or if you have decided that today is the day that you want to accept Jesus as your Savior and stop living in sin and stop trying to fill yourself with the things that only temporarily make you happy, then I invite you to come forward and talk with our leaders who will be up here. Thank you.